This program was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. It was the fourth year of our war for independence. We in Fairfield were distant from the great battles and major campaigns. For that we were thankful. Yet the war was always with us. Our war was amongst ourselves, neighbor against neighbor. Some in our town had remained loyal to the king and they opposed independence. The others, such as my husband, were determined the Tories should be punished. For myself, I abhorred the spirit of bitterness between neighbors. Merciful Father, grant that whatsoever I take in hand this day, whether of a private or a public nature, and especially in the judgment of others, may tend to the glory of thy name and the good of our country. For Jesus Christ, thy son's sake. Amen. 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 Mama, Amelia's putting molasses into her coffee. Mind your own plate, Jemmy. Tastes better than without. Ma'am, I hear Mr. Hodgkins has in 200 weight of sugar. Hadn't we get some before it's all gone? We can do without. I'll be in court all day. You'll see to the south field? Yes, sir. We're not so far along as we should be. My husband was state's attorney, whose duty it was to prosecute the Tories. Though I was anxious about these events, I believed he would be the voice of moderation and mercy. A woman in your condition should banish all cares. Your help, sir. Always at your service, madam. <laughs> the state of Connecticut presents that Daniel Griswold and Benjamin Glover did unlawfully and traitorously form a design to join with the enemies of this state 
and that they did go from the town of Fairfield over to Long Island in the state of New York, now in the possession of the King of Great Britain, and there did endeavor to aid and assist the King's forces in carrying on the war against this and the rest of these United States, which we hereby declare to be an act of high treason against the state of Connecticut. That afternoon, quite by accident, I met a man who was soon to enter the life of my family. He was a privateer, a class of men despised by my husband. From General Clinton's own plate. You'll pay well for these in New Haven. M uh, Mr. Silliman. You've uh, come for the pins? Yes. Oh, and uh, three ounces of thread. These men cared only for profit and took any side in this war that might bring an advantage. Begging your pardon, ma'am. We'll be going to the trial. No. Here you are. Thank you. Good day, your ladyship. You're too bold, Holly. On the contrary, the wife of a state's attorney should never be ignored. I estimate the middle of September. This one kicks and kicks at me like I've never felt with the others. Like the devil himself, eh? <laughs> I'll allow you're not 20 years of age, Mary, but otherwise you've no cause for alarm. You feel well to me. Jury's come back. I've gone out. Can't say which. I hope they're made to bow and lick the dust. With God's help, may it be only that. You've a kind heart, Mary. But if you get about town with such opinions, people won't know which side of the fence you've landed on. It can do your husband no good. You have no authority! I am a subject of King George! Defendants will rise, Daniel Griswold and Benjamin Glover. You are to go from here to the Fairfield County Jail. And from there, on the fifth day of June, in the year of our Lord, 1779, to the place of execution. Curse you, Solomon! Curse your wife and all your brats! You devil! And there to be hanged. Hanged by the neck between the heavens and the earth until you are dead. The truth was, my husband had never expected a sentence of execution, but only prison. From that moment, he was the object of hatred for all who opposed the war. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments away, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Amen. Mama, you said away. It's keep my commandments always. Yes, that's a good scholar. Now it's time for sleep. You go on up. Good night, Good night Dada. Dada. I'm going be up in a moment. You seem distressed. I am, Selleck. More than distressed. I'm afraid events have passed quite beyond my understanding. This county has never before hung a man for being a Tory. 
A Tory and a traitor, Mary. Ben came back only for his wife and children, Selleck. What will become of them now? And Mrs. Griswold, a widow? And Daniel, her only son? What will happen to her? Have we grown so short of mercy? Let it be, Mary. Nothing can be done. You could speak to the governor. The governor and the council have made their wishes known. From now on, the law will be strictly executed. And you are not opposed to this? Do you really not understand? The people are sick of this war. How does it appear to them when your Glovers and Griswolds go over to the enemy and get fat bounties for serving the king? Will they stand with their country or will they go over too? One thousand men from Fairfield County, my county, have gone over to the enemy. And when we finally have our hands again on these traitors, shall we treat them like prodigal sons? For our own preservation, Mary, the lines now must be sharply drawn. Where will it end? Let us pray that it ends here. And if it does not, then there must be other examples to the world. Selick, if this has to be, must we be party to it? Couldn't you step aside as state's attorney? You who've done more than any man in the county, surely- You mistake your province. I can't help it. Shall our hands be dipped again and again in the blood of our neighbors? They are flesh of our flesh, and blood of our blood. Mary! What a horrid spectacle for our children. Damn it, Mary! If I'm not meant to serve, then the good Lord will so direct me. But I will not tolerate this rebellion in my own home. Almighty God, let the consuming passions of hatred and revenge, which have gripped so many hearts, not touch my own. And forgive me, your humble servant, for creating division in my house. My pride overcame me. Time enough later. Fortunate your gun misfired. If you'd killed one of us, I'd burn your house and your family in it. Dress yourself. You're my prisoner now.
What's that barrel, Mr. Hooker? I learned only much later that Captain Holly, that very same night, was taking illicit goods onto our shore. Had he only acted then, he'd have saved my family enormous grief. Look lively, General! Several days later, I received word which was a dagger to my heart. On the 5th of June, when the Tories here would be executed, my beloved husband would be hung. I felt the light and glory depart from this world if my other self was to leave it. For with him would expire my own existence. I could hardly rise each day, neglecting even the children. I feared that God was punishing this family, and I had an awful premonition that it would grow worse. I think my baby's dead. I felt no movement, not since Selleck was taken. You've so many times told me of women who, who see a frightful thing in their children born dead or unnatural. Can you tell? Is it alive? I can't tell, Mary. But I can almost hear your thoughts. You think the child is dead. Have faith, Mary. God brought me no relief. Yet it is so often the case that when our hearts are closed by pride or stubbornness, we cannot see it ourselves. I have prayed many times for strength and serenity, but God hides his face. I feel nothing of his love. It is you who will not love God. You couldn't say that to me, whom you've known all these years. Look honestly into your heart, Mary. 
Can you say I am truly resigned to his will? I'm not a child. Why do you talk to me as a child? The cup thy father puts in thy hand, wilt thou drink it? Are you willing to give up your husband if that is what God requires? Even your unborn child, if that is God's plan? Will you pray with me? The wise and merciful governor of the universe, I have often said thy will be done, but now thy will is painful to me. But shall I on that account unsay what I have so often said? My dearest, please know that death holds no terrors for me. If I am taken now, you will be in the hands of that kind benefactor who will protect and bless you so long as you trust in him. But the subject is too moving to dwell upon. While breath remains, let us choose subjects of this world. A strange occurrence, my dear. An acquaintance from my Yale College days has visited me here and comes again today. Although a Tory, he is far above the barbarities practiced by ruffians on that side. Judge Thomas Jones, Chief Justice of the Superior Court of Long Island. Thomas, it's good to see you again so soon. Selick. brought you very good news, of which we shall toast in a moment. Good news for a condemned man. Come, sit. I've brought the finest Madeira from my cellar. What is it? This afternoon, I visited with a British official whose word I value greatly. As we speak, there sits a proposal before your governor in Hartford means of which you will be exchanged. To be effected immediately. Thomas, from whom does this offer come? The British? No, the loyal refugees. Then they are. And in return, they will have Griswold and Glover. Yes, I think those were the names. Have I raised your hopes without cause? The council will never agree. My own words will argue against it. I see. But it's not impossible. There is a chance. The governor's no fool, and I flatter myself that he relies on me as much as any man on the coast. And the people, the people may indeed have something to say about this. Were I the governor, you'd have won me over, sir. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> I was about to write Mary a letter that would have caused her a great deal of pain. Now, in good conscience, I can write a letter of hope. Indeed. Shall we drink to former times? To Yale. To Yale. God has opened a door for us, my love, and we are called upon to act with the greatest urgency. Draw up a petition signed by as many good citizens of Fairfield as possible, requesting that I am needed by the town and must be returned. Forward the petition to Governor Trumbull by the quickest means possible. God's will be done, but the use of means is also our duty. Your ever faithful, affectionate, and loving husband, G. Selig Silliman. Sorely missing her husband by now. (laughs) (laughs) 
Good day, pretty one. Yes? I've come to see your mistress. I have no mistress. Are you not one of the servants? <laughs> None but Negroes are servants. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't wait outside. Mrs. Silliman won't be back for an hour. Thank you. What uh, business have you with Mrs. Silliman? It's very important. I can't divulge. Do tell me. Why don't you tell me about your master's capture? Why should I? Because then I shall tell you about my important business. Then, the biggest one, this Ferris, bursts into my room, drags me out of bed. And me, just in my shift. And he says, I'd be for carrying you off too, darling. And wrapping his big paw around me, here. Just like this. He nuzzles into my ear and says, awful pretty damn rebel. So I spun away like so. I said, you smelled of the manure field when you left Solomon Ferris, and nothing much has changed. <laughs> Awful pretty damn rebel. You're Holly? David Holly, ma'am. Your humble and obedient servant. Amelia, something's burning. What do you want here? I brought a letter from your husband. You're welcome to stay for dinner. God has opened a door for us, my love, and we are called upon to act with the greatest urgency, your ever faithful, affectionate, and loving husband. Your line of work must bring a handsome profit, Mr. Holly. My husband said that a privateer would make ten times the living of an honest farmer. Oh, no, ma'am. But we're a great source of trouble to the enemy. That, I can assure you. Speaking for myself, ma'am, only two nights ago, we surprised a brig in Lloyd's Harbor. I cut her out and brought her safely into Stamford without losing a man. She carried 2,000 pairs of boots and 1,000 uniforms intended for Clinton's army. And silk cloth enough for a hundred gowns. Silk? I'd go begging for silk. But speaking of your husband, ma'am, I'm a great admirer of Mr. Silliman's and wish him well. Allow me to offer my services however they might be useful towards speeding his return. Thank you, Mr. Holly. All that can be done, we shall do. You must know it's very hard to send anything in behind enemy lines. A letter may take weeks to come to hand, or never does. So I am told. I have many friends on Long Island. I can get a letter to your husband, or more than that. Say you wish to send in summer clothing. The proposition is simple. Two traitorous scum for one gentleman. 
That's just good trading, and we'd be fools to do any worse. Sir, I repeat myself. To release men convicted of high treason would enrage a good part of this country. But people have said they must swing for it. Rubbish. Who signed the petition, if not the people? Sir, the county of Fairfield is not the entire state. Mr. Hosmer, you've had little to say today. Your Excellency, it is our responsibility to anticipate the public mind. If we stand our ground and refuse to release the Tories, it will command respect from the people and brace their spirit. But if we show weakness, they will lose heart. They might say, let us all be Tories, for the government itself cannot stand up to the enemy. Precisely. Uh, before we vote, I think it only courteous that we give an audience to Mrs. Silliman. Mrs. Silliman, please. Mrs. Silliman, good to see you again. Your Excellency. Please, have a seat. Thank you, sir. Now. Allow me to express my gratitude to Your Excellency and to the Council for giving audience to one of my sex. I know nothing of politics and don't mean to transgress but the plight of my dear husband occupies my thoughts and has caused me to deliver this petition in person to beg your assistance for the sake of my family. With Mr. Silliman absent, we have no means of getting a support. I am left with two sons, the oldest barely eight, and the babe I now carry. But uh, these arguments are nothing next to the character of Mr. Silliman. He has carried a great burden in this war and has never sought private gain, but did only what was his duty as an honest man. I beg your assistance also on behalf of the town. Pardon me, Mrs. Silliman, if I might save you any trouble. Uh, the petition itself is very adequate on all of these points. Is there anything else, madam? Thank you, no. Yes, if I might. It is not the province of my sex to reason deeply upon politics, but I hope you will allow a poor woman one observation. This policy lately adopted of enforcing loyalty with the hangman's noose is, I believe, the source of all our troubles, and I fear that we have only begun to reap the consequences. If the Tories are executed, and then my husband, it will begin a round of bloodletting on this coast, tit for tat, that will terrify everyone. And where it will end, only God knows. Soldiers can live with such horror, but not the people. Perhaps there is an opportunity now to, to step back from the abyss before it is too late. I believe this matter is far too important to be decided by anyone but the people themselves. Therefore, I am referring the matter of an exchange to the General Assembly, which will meet in six weeks' time. You will have your answer then. Accordingly, the execution of Ben Glover and Daniel Griswold will be postponed. Mrs. Sullivan. I shall do everything in my power to bring about your husband's return. I wish you a safe and pleasant journey homewards. Good day.
Fairfield, July 18th. My dearest husband, the farming carries well with Peter at the helm. We need more hands, but only one can be found. Adam Sayers is hired and gets on well with Peter. My darling, good news. A commissary agent for the army is in these parts, buying up grain and beef at any price. They promise to pay one dollar a bushel in hard money. I've arranged to deliver 120 bushels by October 1st, but we will need more hands at harvest. Adam works partly in the tavern now, but during harvest will give us all his time. I told him you would look kindly upon his helping the family, and I think that swayed him. Peter, what was the name of that other Negro? The one that ran off? Joe. That's him. He's the one that took that whaleboat over from Greenwich. Damn my old shoes if he ain't a free man by now. Lord, there must be hundreds of Negroes over to the island by now. All of them set free by General Clinton. What do you think of that? I don't need to go over now. The governor made a new law. Says I can get my freedom by joining General Washington's army. No, sir. Not without Mrs. Silliman's permission, you can't join. No, sir. I'd wager a keg of beer she wouldn't give it. Dearest Selleck, I now have written to every member of the General Assembly, beseeching them to vote for the exchange. I hope that I am not accused of presumption, but I believe any sensible man will see the advantages of your return. My husband, my concern for you is very great. We hear there is much smallpox on the island and spreading rapidly. Does your situation as a prisoner expose you? Until I hear from your own hand that you are well, there will be little sleep here. Sometimes we lie like pigs in a sty with a little old straw on the ground. But we are as happy and we sweep as well as those who have thousands of pounds. Let the back of the sides sing their voice. Let the hand and the feet gang cold. Give but the belly boys ill enough, whether it be new or old. Give but the belly boys ill enough, whether it be new or old. Won't your mistress be expecting you? Nah. I've gone to Aunt Jennings, I told her. Are you gone for the whole night? The letters come from Mrs. Silliman. Appears to be from the governor. Let me see that. You shan't. all this? Compliments of Captain Holly. When did you see Holly? There's 200 weight of sugar, a barrel of molasses, and five yards of English worsted. Take that out. And this sack, too. Return everything to Mr. Holly. Ma'am, have you lost your senses? You hold your tongue. I won't have stolen goods in my home. It's from a British ship. Who knows from where it came? Your Holly's nothing but a pirate. He ain't. He's a privateer commissioned by the governor himself. Was this taken in battle or from a Tory woman defenseless in her home? 
I don't know. And I don't much care. Give it back! Well, you're not above dealing with the devil. He carries letters for you. Where if you like. The poor owner's by now resigned if she isn't dead and buried. Forgot. It was a letter for you at the tavern. From Mr. Silliman? The governor. They've agreed. The assembly's agreed to the exchange. Go tell Mrs. Nash. No, wait. Tell Esther Glover first. Dying's hard work, ain't it? Now, isn't this a griper? How many times have I wished you did? And here I am, keeping you alive. But you seem to be slipping away, General. And then we'd be all at a loss. So, I'm thinking tomorrow morning we had better cross the Sound. If you're still breathing when we reach Connecticut, the bargain will be sealed. You'll go. I'm making the arrangements straight away. So, don't make a fool of me and die before tomorrow. My darling, received news of your illness, but no word from you. My thoughts hover constantly about you. I can do nothing for you but pray that a life so precious may be spared. There, there will be no exchange. General Clinton won't approve it. Not approve, you say? Sit down, Mr. Bunnell. You sons of bitches. Sit down, Mr. Bunnell. I risked my life to get Solomon. And my nephew about to hang? Corporal. Mr. Bunnell, His Majesty has set General Clinton over all his forces in America. And General Clinton has set me over all the Tories like you. Now, sir, if you presume to serve the King, you must obey. Why? What do they want? More than we are presently offering, ma'am. As I view it, General Clinton did not ask for your husband, but now he's got him. And he's thinking, don't it set a bad example to trade such as your husband being a state's attorney for a rabble like Glover and Griswold? Death sentence or no? It's cruel business. It is, ma'am. The Redcoats have raised the stakes. But two can play the same game. I mean, we take our own prisoner. Someone the British will be happy to exchange for Mr. Silliman. But surely you couldn't capture a British officer. No, ma'am. You mean to take a civilian? But no ordinary man. A great Tory, a man of such standing that even Clinton must have him back. Thank you for bringing the letter, Mr. Hawley, and for your offer of help. But I feel weary now. Begging your pardon, ma'am. 
But could the lady at least state her objections? Does it require explanation? I could hardly do to another family what has been done to my own, particularly to an innocent party. Yes, ma'am, but the Reverend... Enough, Mr. Hawley. As you wish, ma'am. To the good Christian, war is an entrapment, requiring the greatest vigilance and searching into ourselves. As much as any man, I am deeply taken with the spirit of liberty. But who can doubt that this war has brought forth amongst a previously godly people a host of sin and corruption, profaning the Lord's name, avarice and naked self-interest, wanton acts of violence, and throughout a horrid lack of restraint in which all the passions run to excess. In July, a new plan formed. We left Fairfield and embarked for the Continental Army Camp at Peekskill, New York, some three days distant. We learned that General Washington was able to get back captured civilians such as my husband in exchange for British prisoners of war. To support our case, we carried a letter from Governor Trumbull drawn in the strongest terms, requesting that my husband be traded. I was concerned, however, in taking Peter so long from the farm. He was a most loyal friend. Without him, my husband's absence would have led me quickly to ruin. Mrs. Silliman, may I speak plainly? I wish to go into the army, into the Connecticut line. Oh, that's impossible, Peter. Begging your pardon, ma'am. You would gain a high bounty if you were to enlist me. The bounty this month is raised to $250. The army is a hard place for a man your age, Peter. I would risk it. I could never do that without Mr. Silliman's permission. Perhaps when Mr. Silliman returns. You can be assured I will relay this proposal to General Washington, but I'm quite certain the General will deny it. But this request comes personally from the governor of a state. Mrs. Silliman, your husband may be state's attorney, but he is still a civilian. If we traded British soldiers for our own civilians, the enemy would simply raid the coast and take as many poor farmers as they need to trade up. But the governor spoke of several cases. And they have been a great source of trouble to us ever since. That is why, last week, Congress passed a strict measure against trading civilians. Not two years ago, my husband was part of your army. He nearly gave his life at Manhattan and White Plains. He fought alongside you at Danbury, having two horses shot from under him. Does that count for nothing? It is unfortunate that your husband was not taken while on active duty. <sighs> then, perhaps we could do something for him. An unfortunate distinction. My darling, I will not be discouraged by recent events. Today wrote to Governor Green of Rhode Island, inquiring if they have in captivity anyone which the British might exchange for you. Tonight, we'll draft a letter to Massachusetts. We will bend every effort, my dearest, and divine assistance will provide some way.
dearest Mary, something is in the air. I have been summoned to the home of Judge Jones in Oyster Bay. He did not state the occasion precisely, but I hope soon to write you with good news. One more toast to the Silliman family, to the arrival of a perfect babe, and long life thereafter. Thank you. And thank you for a table so well provided. Thank you, sir. But Thomas, you didn't prepare me for a guest so articulate on so many subjects. On the contrary, ma'am, my knowledge is all superficial and much inflated tonight by the wine. <laughs> <laughs> Not so. Mr. Silliman is a fine orator. We opposed each other at Yale many times. Once I recall the subject was, shall proper authority be continued in society? <laughs> you had fine ideas then, Silliman. I believe them still. Ah, uh, gentlemen, if you're about to talk politics, Perhaps you'll excuse us now. Good night, Mr. Silliman. Good night. Good night, Mr. Silliman. Good night. Don't worry about Mary. I gave birth when I was over 40 years. We'll talk in the parlor, Silliman. Our ideas in those days were not so different, Selig. I wager they are really not so different today. I'm too full of comfort and wine. Must we debate tonight? I always thought you were a man of sense. So I told General Clinton just yesterday. What is it? Do you have some news? Selig, you must now be aware that you will not be exchanged. Connecticut cannot offer what General Clinton wants, and with each month, the General seems to find greater value in keeping you. That is why I have intervened on your behalf and obtained a special dispensation from General Clinton. If you will, on your honor as a gentleman, promise to withdraw from this war completely. Hold, Selleck. I spoke for you, now hear me out. General Clinton is ready to send for Mary and the children under a flag of truce. You'll be given a large home here on the island, suitable to your station. You'll be allowed to practice your profession and avert the financial ruin which is now almost certain. Many good men have come over, Selig. Moderate men of good sense who want to see order and good government restored. Thomas, perhaps you mean to help me. But isn't it more cruel than friendly to make such an offer, knowing I must refuse? It's not cruelty, but desperation. I want to save your life. Oh, don't worry so. I flatter myself that Trumbull won't hang the Tories, not while I'm still held. You don't understand. It's gone far beyond Glover and Griswold now. If you do not accept this offer, General Clinton means to make an example of you. You made a great show of dispensing revolutionary justice, Selig. You tried to frighten the people into line. Clinton means to show the citizens of Connecticut that you have it all turned around. But the real traitor is one who is disloyal to his king, and you are the one who should hang. The choice is yours, Selig. The plan has a cruel practicality to it. Yet on the other hand, Thomas, what a victory this would be for you to get the state's attorney to lie down before the king and that perhaps only on a bluff. The morning of September 11th, I awoke early, hoping to begin harvest that day. Several hours later, Captain Hawley brought a letter that would shatter my hopes. Suddenly, I realized my efforts were futile. My dearest, 
hoping by now the harvest has begun and the children are diligently helping to make you comfortable. You will find I have enclosed a new will. I know well how this will strike and affect you, but it is only the work of a rational man who concedes that he is mortal and that our circumstances are uncertain. I have sent this will to you open so that you may see what I have written. My wish is to give satisfaction. If I have done that, I shall rejoice. If you should wish any alteration, please write one and let me know it. The remainder of papers concerning our estate will be found in the trunk in our bedroom. Mrs. Silliman, will you suffer me to speak? There is a man, Judge Jones of Oyster Bay, Chief Magistrate of the Superior Court of New York. One of the greatest Tories on the island, and none is more respected by General Clinton. I know Oyster Bay like the palm of my hand. I have people well placed there who live as Tories by day, but at night become as you pay them. I can bring Jones out. Few men could do this, but I can. I'm considering a violent act. My children need a father. I need my husband. God would not have us descend into barbarism, even for your husband's sake. God is testing you, Mary, as he tempted Jesus in the desert. If you defy him now out of selfish desires, you may bring down upon yourself an even greater judgment. By trying to save your husband, you may cause his destruction or provoke the enemy against your family and lose his son. You might provoke retribution against the town itself and then how many people will die? Consider how merciful God has been to you and be grateful. You have still your children, your home, your land. Your husband is still alive. It may yet be God's will to return your husband in his own good time when his own wise purposes are answered. Be patient, Mary. Because my thoughts dwelt solely on my husband, I gave little notice to other dangers we might face. I never imagined that the man in our employ, Adam Sayers, would betray us. It's time to spread the horror of war into the bowels of New England. September 15th. How many? 500 regulars under Colonel Trinan and 100 Connecticut men with Isaac Punel. We need Mr. Silliman's list of militia, their strength, cannon, and powder. How much do you estimate? Near 120 bushels, maybe 150, and enough fodder to keep the cattle half a winter. I was thinking, Mrs. Silliman, after harvest, I could put in some clover, 
Then plow it under in the spring. And put wheat in. The wheat will bring in more cash now. Well, I will let you and Mr. Silliman decide such matters. Yes, ma'am. Peter. The red coats have attacked New Haven this morning. The militia's going off. We'll need every man. New Haven? Are you certain? Your man Adam just came from there. Ha! Take the bay. Show them what it means to fight for home and country. We'll give them a warm reception, Abby. and get the wagon. Please take Rebecca and Lucy. Are you not going? I won't see my home burned. Well, I can hold it. But, Mama. They won't hurt a woman, Lucy. God protect you, Abby.
Stay together now. I'll talk to them. Sir, we implore you to spare our town. You can see that we do not oppose your landing. What earthly good would it do to burn our homes? We have put our confidence in a people who were once famed for their generosity and politeness. Good people of Fairfield, we call upon you now to swear allegiance to the King of Great Britain, whereupon we will offer you refuge. <laughs> Charge your bayonet! Charge! As we retreated from the town, I realized why the British had attacked now. They meant to burn all of our crops in the hope that General Washington's army would starve this coming winter. But the brutality they showed against the town, even as they were unopposed, was never to be expected. I wondered what God intended by this carnage and desolation. I wondered what it was he intended that I should do. The British retreated to their boats at nightfall, leaving the town in ashes. The militia did not return until the next morning. Two miles outside of New Haven, they'd been ambushed by a company of Tories laying in wait. Twenty souls were lost, including Peter. Just rest, Abby. Take Judge Jones. But there are certain conditions I wish observed. What may those conditions be? Give me your word of honor. There will be no plunder. You have it. Nor murder. I can't be caught, ma'am. There's a price on my head. But you will try to avoid bloodshed. I hope this will retain you for the present. I haven't more now. I will get October the 16th, the tide is high. We go then. Good day, Mr. Holly. Thank you. 
Good day, ma'am. Right away, ma'am. Go. Get Mrs. Nash. I'll get Mrs. Silliman home. Go. Wouldn't you know Mrs. Silliman? My other talent is positioning. the butter. I never met the trying hour with such fortitude before nor did my trust fail. Through the hours I prayed constantly for God to grant me this blessing, to make me the living mother of a living child. He showed me that we were not disowned, and my heart was filled with praise. Here is your sign, Mary. When the day arrived to attempt the capture, Abby's husband, Captain Nash, insisted on being present. He said it was to ensure the mission was carried out humanely. There's some regulars posted 50 yards behind those trees, but they received a gift of rum. Compliments to Judge Jones. We'll be gone before they awaken. Sir. We are thinking, what are we to get in taking Jones? I said, no plunder. We run a great risk, sir. We don't know, but we may be killed. You may all be hanged when we return. Not with our good captain's permission. Unless you give leave to plunder, sir, we go no further. Letters to his son. Yes, I've heard them. Is there an indispensable? Oh. Hold. Ah.
was told everything. Captain Nash, they said, was down at the wharf and badly wounded. leg off. Oh, no. Go home. <sighs> Selleck would have done the same thing for him. Satisfied now, Mrs. Silver. We are taught that nothing happens in this world but what God intends. I trust that is so. But even were I the instrument of God, there was no consolation for the grief and shame that overwhelmed me. <laughs> Two weeks went by, and then another. There was no response from the enemy to our offer to trade Judge Jones. I thought perhaps I had lost everything. On November 3rd, a boat appeared off the coast under a British flag of truce. She signaled that she carried prisoners. Captain Nash went out to meet the boat, hoping to see my husband, but in vain. On the British boat was Isaac Bunnell. He carried two Fairfield men as prisoners and wished to exchange these for his nephew and Daniel Griswold. But Captain Nash could not release the two Tories. Instead, he asked Bunnell about my husband and if the British meant to return him in exchange for Judge Jones. But Bunnell damned my husband and said that he would never be released. There seemed no longer any rational hope to cling to, but my heart could not be resigned. Over and over I wondered if there was yet some means I had not seized upon. I was very sorry to hear that Mr. Jones will not be exchanged, but do not give up hope. You're very kind, sir, and I haven't lost hope. I think still there may be another way. Another way? What do you mean? Sir, I don't presume to know for certain. But perhaps, sir, we are dealing with two faces of the enemy. Now, I mean to say, General Clinton and the better sort of Tories, they want to get back Mr. Jones. But now in his sort, they want Glover and Griswold. And the general can't trade Mr. Jones for my husband because Bunnell would be very put out. 
His nephew would be still in jail and likely to be hung as soon as my husband is released. Has this Bunnell so much influence? He's only a shoemaker. He's made a name now. General Clinton has appointed him captain of the loyal refugees. I have this information from a man in your service, sir. I see. Go on. If we were to go to take a boat to Sheepshead Bay, where I am told General Clinton is residing, and take not only Mr. Jones, but also Ben Glover and Daniel Griswold, we could tie one exchange to the other. We will give them the men who are sentenced to death and get back our Fairfield men in return, if and only if they will give us Mr. Silliman for Mr. Jones. But the assembly agreed to give up Glover and Griswold only for Silliman, no one else. Well, yes, sir. And if it were done altogether in this fashion, would it not be so? Hmm. There is great risk in it, Mary. Captain Holly asked if he might carry the prisoners to Sheepshead Bay and attempt the negotiation. To my surprise, he refused any compensation. Sit. Mr. Holly. I would rather know for certain, before you reach the shore on your return, whether or not you have Mr. Silliman on board. Yes, ma'am. If I have Mr. Silliman, I shall hoist two flags. I shall do my best, ma'am. Thank you. Then I hope to see you in several days. Tomorrow they'll be singing praises for Mr. Holly and his pretty wife to be. Hi. Now it's time to go. The vessel carrying Judge Jones left at 8 o'clock that morning. In two days, we thought the outcome would be known. I tried not to indulge my hopes for fear of disappointment. Look sharp. Expecting us, sir. Come about! Turn it around! Go, boy! Go, boy! Go, your asses off! Go, you bastards! Go for your lives! Bloody business, gentlemen. At one o'clock, we saw the same boat returning. I knew they hadn't time to go to Sheepshead Bay. Why had they turned back?
Mama. I think they received bad news on the way, Jimmy. Mama, what is it? This exchange was a remarkable coincidence. On the same day we in Connecticut were sending off Judge Jones, they in New York were sending off my husband with the very same intent, and the two vessels chanced to meet in the sound. Oh, my dearest. The war would go on another four years. When independence was finally won, the hatreds that had divided our town eventually healed and then were forgotten. My husband continued as state's attorney and we spoke little of the events that separated us and then brought us together again. But often I have looked back on the season I passed through and wondered if I might have acted differently though I acted according to the best light I had. Only heaven will determine.
This program was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities.